Anyway, we're talking, we're talking about space police and space precinct. So what I thought we'd do to kick it, kick it off. Can you believe it's actually... Uh, when, when did they make the space precinct? No, space police pilot. 1980... Anybody got an answer to that? 85, was it? Way before I was born. Oh, come on. Yeah. Way before I was born. A long time. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do then, because uh, there's a lot of people here who I suspect won't remember it because you're far, far too young. We're going to show a, a, a trailer for uh, the pilot called Space Police, and uh, it's going to be on the screen behind you, Shane, if you want to. Well, no, don't bother. You've seen it. <laughs> With my memory, I've forgotten every clue. Well, anyway, it's coming up. This is uh, Space Police. Mentor Films presents Jerry Anderson's Space Force. <laughs> Lieutenant Brogan needs a change, and he gets it. A posting to the other side of the galaxy. How much they pay you, Brogan? I want to see how I am. That's the one who's in. How long? The best in live action performances, breathtaking model work, and spectacular special effects will make this the TV space series of the decade. Space Force. Family entertainment for prime time. Watch this space. I must admit that um, the first time I ever saw it, this is a little anecdote which uh, we, we did a convention about 25 years ago in Bristol and Jerry Anderson was the, the special guest and he actually yeah. brought down, this is, this will have been around about the time that they made it, a couple of years later, and Jerry actually brought down the pilot on, on film, uh, on, the, on a big, uh, you know, so we actually saw it, probably the first people other than people that made it to see it so uh, and we were we were pretty pretty impressed and uh, what surprises me Shay um, is that uh, you don't look a day older so you know you haven't changed a bit you know what you haven't changed a bit you look just ah you don't look a day older, older. <laughs> oh wait. this is where the fun starts yeah so did that bring bring back yeah, bring back a lot of happy memories. <laughs> Quite happy. I mean, it's a very brave venture, Jerry, to mix humans and uh, animal animal life. Uh, I'm not sure it ever been been done before. I don't know where they had a wardrobe that was left over from something else. Uh, it really was, um, as I say, a very brave venture having these strange animals wandering around. So. Who, which, or who, or what, uh, never appeared on the face of the earth before. I mean, were, some of them were absolutely grotesque. I don't know why you're looking at me. <laughs> but I mean, Jerry Anderson has always uh, obviously been cutting edge. And I think perhaps what, what people maybe now don't appreciate is what you just said. That was really uh, an unusual thing to be doing, especially in the 1980s. And uh, yeah. Yeah. I remember, as I say, we saw it at the convention and uh, uh, yeah, we, we thought this is going to be a series, <coughs> a bit serious, but um, it didn't quite make the... No, I'm uh, I, I think Hollywood, uh, or whoever the, the American partners were, or the, the, the participants, uh, didn't, didn't buy it. Uh, the, the idea was, if they, they say, look, either it's animals or it's humans. I think that was the problem. It didn't, in their eyes anyway, meld properly. So. But it was a lot of fun. it was a lot of fun. Sometimes you forgot who you were talking to, a human or an animal or whatever. What You're looking at me again, aren't you? So in a way, well, it's the way my head goes around like this. So in a way, Shay, it's uh, not personal. In a way, it was kind of the um, the uniqueness of it kind of handicapped it in a way, uh, if you know. Maybe, 
nearly. But it looked good, and uh, in yeah, case anyone's not aware, it is available now on DVD yeah. for the first time, I believe. So uh, if you're not got your copy, go and get it now. Um, but of course, um, it was written by your old mate Tony Barwick. Tony Barwick, yeah. And but what can you tell us about about Tony? Tony was. He had been uh, involved in script writing in England, and then he went, uh, was, went to Silicon Valley in California, which is a sort of top gathering place for computer experts and all this uh, tribal stuff. Anyway, he was doing very well then, and then uh, he got a call from, uh, from Jerry, or the Jerry office, and said, I need you. They had worked before, and they had worked uh, very nicely together. And uh, Jerry realized that he needed somebody to put this thing into more visible uh, access. So uh, Tony did. He, did. he loved it out in California. A lot of good golf courses and things like this were very handy. Uh, and he never stopped writing. He got back here and immediately dived into uh, Space Police. Um, it was a, a fantastic ad ad adventure, as I say, for him, trying to meld animal life and, uh, and uh, human life. I, I think it missed by a fraction, though. I, 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 something was slightly missing. Whether it was, it was always interesting to see, and the uh, special effects were absolutely out of this out of this world, literally and uh, truthfully. But, uh, to go back to Tony for a second, Tony Barwick was uh, renowned for his sense of humour. And there's, um, I know you and Tony became really good friends. And there's a great clip which I think just saw where you, or uh, Brogan, is, is, you've got a guy, you've got your gun on him, and you say, uh, put your hands up, and these two hands come up. And then you say, all of them, and two more come up. And that, I thought, was funny. Uh, yeah. that, that, was, that was Tony Ball. Right That's off the wall, yeah. Kind of Dick Spanner sort of, sort yeah. of humour, which yeah, he did sure. later on. So, uh, so it was good fun. And was it filmed at, it was filmed at Pinewood, was it, or Bray? Somewhere like that. It was filmed Bray. at Bray. Right, yeah. Bray. Which, Hammer Horror. Hammer Horror Studio. Yeah, a bit of this was like that too, I think. So. So, so basically, Space Police, you did the pilot, yeah. Uh, nothing happened for uh, for a few years, unfortunately. Although yeah. it did, of course, finally become uh, a TV series. Although the name was changed. So before we actually watch, uh, before we see the the, uh, the continuation of Space Police, we'll have a quick look at uh, what the series eventually became, which uh, I think I'm right in saying was called Space Precinct. So we'll have a clip of that. Yeah. Normal service will be resumed as soon as possible. It's not doing much. Oh. There we are. The name's Brogan. Lieutenant Brogan. For 20 years I was with the NYPD. Now, well, let's just say I have transferred to another precinct. There you go. So that was uh, Space Precinct. So obviously uh, we have here the two, the two Richards, um, one of whom was behind the camera and one of whom was uh, behind, uh, in front of the camera, although uh, possibly not as you are appearing today. Possibly not. <laughs> possibly not. <laughs> so have you got any idea, just briefly, why, why did the show become Space Precinct as, as opposed to Space Police? Ah, but the name change? Yeah. yeah, well, back in the day, there was a very popular series of Lego toys called Space Police. We actually started filming the series under the name of Space Police for the first, I guess, two, two or three months or so. Maybe not quite that long. And suddenly a memo went round that it's now called Space Precinct 88. We're changing the name of the series because Lego have copyrighted the name Space Police. And then eventually that was shortened to Space Precinct, which uh, sounded to the Brits in the cast a bit like a shopping bag. Space shopping van. It doesn't really have the same ring, is it? So it became Space Precinct. Interestingly enough, uh, the, this episode trailer at the end of the title sequence there, if you watch 
the episodes, all 24 of them, you'll notice that over the run of the series, I start to feature more and more in those little recaps at the beginning of the episode, because as the series went on, I started to go out with the assistant editor. And she was in charge of compiling those little snapshots. <laughs> so as the months went by, I started to notice that I was appearing in them more and more. And we got married shortly afterwards. So space precinct changed your life in, in a big way. That sounds rather grand, doesn't it? Yes, I suppose it did, absolutely. I met lots of my heroes. Worked with the likes of John Glenn and Stephen Burkoff and uh, Jerry Anderson, of course. So you worked with Stephen Burkoff and you, just, you lived to tell the tale. I lived to tell the tale, absolutely. Now, with Space Precinct, as we can see, it featured a vast array of very uh, good-looking and uh, unusual characters. Yes. And, of course... Yes, this is, this is Captain Podley, some of you might recognise. It's an original mask, actually, as played by the lovely uh, Jerome Willis who's no longer with us, who, in my opinion, is actually the star of the show. His performance is amazing throughout, a very subtle, nuanced performance. But these are the very comfortable, airy, light masks. So, they so with comfort in mind. So bearing that in mind, I believe we have the gentleman on stage here who actually designed and built the prosthetics. Yeah, um, basically, when we did Space Police, the first Space Police, it was on the back of Terror Hawks. So we were very much a puppet-based production. So we had a mixture of live action and puppets, because Jerry thought, oh, we've got a good crew here, and uh, let's make a, a science fiction TV show with cops on it. So we then started to work on puppets. But years later, when the show was then eventually picked up, Jerry said, do you think we can come up with something new? So we decided to go to live action, but we wanted obviously aliens. So uh, we devised uh, an animatronic maker. Torture chamber. Yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, an animatronic maker which would fit onto actors so we could come up with a really new concept for the aliens. And then we proceeded to uh, get actors into castings, literally. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, Jerry would talk to them and say, you know, oh, would you explain the series and send them over to me in the makeup room and I would then bury them and attend to plaster and algae to see whether or not they were the sort of people who could actually cope with this type of thing. Well, that reminds me, uh, I know Shane, he, he didn't appear in the series, but I'm, I'm, I'm noticing that, um, I'm just looking at that, at that head, and as you say, it looks to me like it was pretty uncomfortable to kind of wear and, and be in, 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 uh, encased within. Now, Shane, many years before you did Space Precinct or Space Police, you did uh, UFO. And in an episode of UFO, they're in a, a, an alien's helmet. So yeah. not, not quite the same, but, but what's it like to be trapped inside something like that that kind of comes down and covers your whole face? Terrible. Because <laughs> I, I, uh, I suffer from asthma. And uh, all, all of a sudden, the world disappeared. And all I could think of was this clunk, 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 oh as I was walking along of this, of this helmet. And then when they tried to unbuckle it or unscrew it, or whatever they did to it, uh, nothing happened. And uh, <laughs> somebody said, get in Pep Richard and tell him to give us a song or something. Uh, it took a while, but it, you do actually feel out of this world. Not nicely out of this world, just eject, ejected out of this world. Ben, is you, uh, you're very grateful that when you did uh, Space Police, you didn't have to wear something like that. Absolutely, terrifically. But, but someone who did, obviously yourself, although not that particular one, uh, what was it like? Uh, can you agree with you know, Shane's sentiments? Oh, yeah, it was, you know, as you can imagine, it wasn't the most comfortable year of my life. You can see here, this is where we used to see out. We had very limited vision. So these wrinkles here, just under the eyes, are where the actor would see out. The servo motors in these eyes here would make a hell of a noise. So your vision was very limited. Your hearing was very limited. Um, we used to wear false teeth as well. Uh, gloved hands. So the only part of us that was visible was our tongues. So if I do this throughout the day, you'll probably recognize me. Gene, Gene Simmons. Oh, yes, Gene Simmons, yes, absolutely. But many actors found it very difficult. There was one actor who was cast to play Sergeant Fredo, who was a different creature. He was a tar blue head and a third eye. He was cast to play the part, and on the first day in his mask, he freaked out. And he couldn't do it. He passed on the job. 
Uh, so well, three cards. In that case, that, that leads me on to another question to the other Richard. And this is, you've got to be honest now, when you're designing and building these masks, what level of consideration do you give to the people that have got to wear them? Yeah, I'd like to know that. It's a very good question. Yeah, as, but as much as humanly possible, to be totally honest, because... So on, on, a, on a feature film, for instance, a makeup like this may take hours, literally hours, and the, the actors would have to stay in it for the entire day, which they obviously had to on space, for instance, as a TV show. So we had to come up with a practical way of uh, keeping the actors alive, basically, and comfortable. Actually, what we used to do between takes, this part here would pop off, and um, alien autopsy going on. There. So actually, uh, we used to spend most of the day like this, uh, which kept us a little bit cooler. So the chin would be glued onto our faces all day. Uh, which is fun when you come to eat your lunch and you end up with a bit of tuna sandwich stuck down here in your chip. But uh, we used to spend most of the day like this and then obviously when we were rehearsing we would pop the head on in the matter of moments, put the poppers in, fire up the engines and away we went. So, so um, just to remind me, you were saying that you, you met your wife on the set of Space Precinct. What can I say? What did she see in me? I know. I imagine that. It must have been quite a shock. You've, got, you've, got, you've got Richard the fact, basically, because, uh, you know. Yes. I hadn't really thought of it that way. I mean, Richard was one of the very first people I met. I had my initial audition with Jerry. Uh, and the next thing I knew, the week later, you've got to take That's fine. We can wait. That's all right. I've oh, just. I've just uh, no, come on. Yeah. Um, and uh, a week later or so, I got a call saying, I've got to go to Pinewood and meet Richard and have your cast done. So I was sitting there covered in alginate and afterwards, afterwards we were just having a little chat. And I said, um, so how many people are you seeing for, for Orin? I can't imagine you're putting many actors through this very expensive process. And he said, well, uh, I'll put it this way, Richard. You're on a short list of one. <laughs> and I thought, oh, am I? Well, that, that means I've got the job, doesn't it? And basically I had already, and this was Brilliant. just a test to see if I could handle the process. Well, I should explain just for a second. The reason I was so rude that I looked at my phone. We've, we've got to wrap up in a minute, but what, what I'll do first... Um, Space Precinct is one of these shows which you can't do justice to, or Space Police, in five or ten minutes. So, is there a book available which we could buy which would tell us what Wouldn't, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Is there a book available? <laughs> I mean, just imagine a picture, a young actor, almost straight out of drama school, penniless, about to give it all up, is suddenly propelled to the heights of Pinewood Studios to work with Jerry Anderson for a year. A very formative experience in which he met his wife, wouldn't it be great if, oh, I don't know, say 20 years later, it would, it would. people would collect a collection of stories, amusing anecdotes, behind the scenes chat, exclusive photographs, and put them in a picture? That would be good. Well, I've got news for you. <laughs> yeah. As chance would have it, I have written such a book. No. It's called, uh, it's, I know, it's called Space Precinct Unmasked. <laughs> and uh, well, you can come and find me over there, I'm selling it just in the corner. Well, have a minute. Well, what? Yeah. Well, it's 15 pounds. 20 to you. Because you answered your phone. That's good news. Now, before we wrap up, just uh, I'm going to say to each, each, one, each one of you in question, in turn, sorry, sorry. What did you, what did you bring away from your involvement with, uh, what's your presiding memory uh, of working on Space Precinct and Space Police? What's the one thing that you can say you took from it? Well, I mean, if you can work with a menagerie of <laughs> animals and strange creatures, uh, you're all right. I mean, then you can face just about any situation anybody's going to put up to you. Uh, you learn to relax. And, 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 and uh, as a matter of fact, some of, the, some of those figures were so uh, incredible. I mean, and they're walking around, talking, doing all sorts of things, except they're not human. And that, that was a slight departure from most of anything I've done before. Uh, it just allows you to think about, it's an acting profession, an acting job that's going on here. No matter what's in front of you, you treat that person as, a, as another human being. I mean, you're nonplussed some of the time. But the, 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 the bravery of that attempt to get that thing on screen and to make it work, and it, it, it was a near miss. Uh, I think was something that just 
kept you into the in the in the, in the picture and say, okay, bring on the next one. Yes, good. And, uh, well, I'll tell you what I took from Space Precinct. Uh, I took my shirt, I took my gun, I took my multicom, I took my character badge, because uh, I thought, well, this is never going to happen again, because it was looking pretty unlikely we were going to do another series. Well, there was a slip. Jay, now you've admitted that Jamie wants them back. <laughs> Don't worry, they're all very well um, for. The other Richard. Well, I think I think for me it was just that it was a great chance to try to do something different, and it was a big adventure because we had a huge crew, and we were really trying to do something that had never ever been done before on television. And I think it, that's what I bring away from it is the fact that as, as the whole exercise, right from start to finish. It was just a great adventure, whichever way you know, went. Brilliant. Well, in that case, we'll have to wrap it up, but uh, don't forget, there is apparently a book available, and uh, photographs and models and everything else, so there you go. Anyway, Richard, Richard and Shane. Thank you.